I want you to go with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 16. And I want to look at verses 16 through 24. The book of Acts, chapter 16. We'll start at verse 16 and land at verse number 24. If you're ready to read it, say yeah. If you ain't ready, say hold up. There's a whole lot of hold ups. You got to hurry up. We got on a beautiful LED screen behind me. Acts chapter 16. And it declares, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so I'm pausing so you can say it. <laughs> Annoyed. That he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews, and they're throwing our city into an uproar. Ooh, they're not just affecting the church. They're affecting the city. They're turning the city upside down. They're not content with just having a cute little powwow with us far and no more and staying within the corridors of a church. They have jacked up the entire city by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept a practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods after they had been severely flogged. They were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. I bet he was. And when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Can you say amen? amen. You tired of standing? Okay, good. I was going to say, if you are, you wore those shoes. That's, that's you. It says in verse 18, she kept this up for many days. And finally, Paul became so annoyed, annoyed. I feel this text tonight, and I don't even know what kind of sermon this is going to be. But I am going to do something that I have never done in all my years of preaching. I'm only going to give you part of my title right now. The rest of the title I'll give you at the end. So if you leave early, you're going to be lost. <laughs> but, but the first part of my title I want to give you tonight is just, I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed. I want you to look at your neighbor, whichever one you like the best, <laughs> and say, neighbor, yeah. I already like this message. <laughs> <laughs> say, neighbor, <laughs> I'm annoyed. Come on, find you another neighbor, the one you completely ignored. Come on, find another neighbor. Say, other neighbor, you my second option. And I like you, but I looked at you second. And maybe because I'm <laughs> annoyed. Have you ever just been annoyed? Have you ever just been just sick of something? Uh, this is going to be good. Would you bow your heads? We're going to pray. Then, then you can sit down. Father, speak to us today give you permission to do whatever you want to do. God, use these feeble lips to speak some truth from your word that will change us. 
God, we're tired of going through the religious routine. God, we need an encounter with you. Have your way. And when we leave, let us say it was so good to have been in the presence of Jesus. In Jesus' name, everybody say it. Come on, everybody say it. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Ooh. I'm. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm. Ooh. Social fam, one of the moments in ministry that I will never forget occurred about 17 years ago. 17 years ago, you all know that I was just getting started in my itinerant ministry. I think it was like 17 years ago or so. And I was in the early stages of my ministry, early stages of preaching. I'm talking about the early stages where if anybody said, you want to preach somewhere, I'm like, yeah, I'll show up. Early stages of ministry. I'm talking about the season of my life when I was working at Banana Republic and preaching the gospel. Y'all know about that. I had a khakis ministry. <laughs> Fold khakis when I could and then go preach when I got an invitation. And I'll never forget in those early stages, those early stages of ministry, I, I started to get a few more bookings and people were calling me. I was like, this is, this is crazy. God is doing something. I, I went to Glamour Shots in the mall. Y'all remember Glamour Shots? <laughs> Glamour. I went to Glamour Shots because I had to give me some professional pictures for my flyers. This is before Instagram, y'all. I had to get professional pictures and had my good little suit on. And I did a pose that every single preacher that is worth their weight in preaching has done. If you don't have a picture like this and you call yourself a preacher, you're new to the game. It was this picture right... <laughs> That's that picture right there. <laughs> made you look like a deep theologian. I took my pictures and I was primarily doing youth groups and youth events and I remember getting a call from a church that I had primarily done their youth events but they said, hey, we want you to come preach Sunday morning. Now, it was in Missouri, I'll never forget. I was like, oh Lord, holla at your boy. I'm getting asked to preach in big church. You know how big church is always big church no matter how old you get. I'm like, this ain't the youth group. They calling me in for big church. This is gonna be powerful. This is gonna be life changing. I cannot wait. Woo! When I got the itinerary for where I was gonna be staying that weekend, preach a big church, I saw something on the itinerary that arrested my attention. I said, this, this, this has to be a typo. This has got to be a mistake. Because the accommodations that this incredible church had put me in, and they typed it on the itinerary, was Motel 6. <laughs> Motel 6. I said, that's, that's, that's got to be a mistake. It's got to be a mistake. Surely they're not putting me, the man of God, in <laughs> Motel 6. And I said, even if they are, I bet it's a nice one. I bet it's a newer one. After all, they say they leave the light on for you. So I wasn't tripping about it at first when I saw it on the itinerary. Pastor picks me up from the airport. I said, man, I'm so glad to be here, big church. And we're driving, and he drops me off at the Motel 6 on Saturday night. I will never forget this. I pulled up to the Motel 6, and the out appearance let me know this is going to be a rough trip. This is going to be a rough trip. He hands me my key to my room and says, there you go. And I'm like, please don't leave me, please. <laughs> hands me my key to my room. I get out of his car with my key to my hotel room at the Motel 6. My key to my hotel room at the Motel 6. My key, not a card, a physical key. <laughs> to this Motel 6. I'm like, okay, Jesus, all right. I said, I'll do whatever you wanted me to do. I walk into this room. It looks like a scene from Forensic Files of Past 48. It, it is crazy. There, there, is, there is stains on the bed and stains on the wall. The pungent odor hit me in my face and jacked up all my nose hairs. It was terrible. There were bugs in the room. Even the roaches were looking at me like, are you really finna stay here? Are you really? 
to stay here. I said, I can't do it. I can't do it. And so I'm stressed. I'm worried about this. And I, all of a sudden, I'll never forget this. I, I, I looked up, because I'm not one of those people. You know, some people, that they're bougie, and then that they expect you to pay for something that they want, and they're the bougie one. I, I'm not like that, okay? I said, you know what? I can get my own accommodations, and that's all that they could do. I can do a little bit more at that season of my life. I couldn't do no Four Seasons, but you know, I said, I could do a Ramada and or something. I got, my budget was better than most till six at the time. And I'll never forget it, I, I looked and I saw there was a Ramada Inn just a few miles up the street and it looked so much nicer. I said, okay, maybe I'll just go there and I'll just stay there instead of this death inn. And the problem, the problem was, is that the pastor dropped me off at the hotel. And he was picking me up Sunday morning for church. So the conundrum that I'm in is, what's going to happen when he comes in the morning if I switch hotels? I was in a predicament. I said, I can't switch hotels. If I do, I'm going to have to go to that hotel and then find my way all the way back to this raggedy motel for him to pick me up. So I said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so I said, you know what? I'm wondering if that's going to look bad for me to switch. So I did what you're supposed to do in that moment. The Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there is wisdom. I called my daddy. I called my father. I called my Nigerian father, and you need to know that he is Nigerian for this story. And I called my dad up. I will never forget this moment. I said, Dad, he said, what? <laughs> I said, Dad, uh, I just got here uh, to preach at this church, and um, th they put me, <laughs> Dad, they put me in a Motel 6. I said, this place is nasty, Dad. It is horrible, Dad. I mean, can you smell it through the phone? I said, this is... <laughs> This is terrible. I said, Dad, th there's a Ramada a, a couple of miles down. I said, I want to switch to that hotel. I want to switch to that hotel. But I'm wondering, will it look bad if the pastor comes back and he finds out I went to another hotel? Dad, I'm just wondering, will that look bad? And I'll never forget what my dad said on the other line of that phone. As soon as I asked him, would that look bad? My dad goes, uh -huh. <laughs> Anytime a Nigerian father <laughs> replies to you with, uh -huh. It's gonna be, it's gonna be bad from there. It's gonna go on downhill from there. He goes, uh -huh. will it be bad? Oh my God, will it be bad? Will it be bad? Of course it would be bad. You mean to tell me that you cannot stay in a Motel 6 for one night? You mean to tell me that that church invited you to preach and you can't stay there for one night? Just one night? Oh my, if the Apostle Paul can be shipwrecked and beaten and weep for the gospel, surely you can stay there for one, oh my goodness, what is wrong with one night? I said, all right, Dad, all right, all right, never mind. <laughs> Hung up the phone, and I stayed there for one night. And he was so mad, and I will never forget that moment. I never forget that moment for as many times as he said, one night? But I also will never forget that moment because I didn't understand it then. Then I was annoyed. But it takes some hindsight to realize the wisdom of what my father was doing. My father was not advocating for me to stay in jacked up hotels. But what he was doing was trying to get me to look at my problem through the lens of my purpose. He was trying to get me to look at the circumstances I was in, in line and with the lens of the purpose and the assignment that was on my life. He was not negating that the hotel was jacked up and was nasty. He was just saying, you can stay there for one night and look at this problem through the lens of your purpose. I want to pause right now and talk to somebody that feels like you're going through a Motel 6 situation and it's a crazy smell and it's roaches and all kinds of things around you. You need to learn how to look at your problems through the lens of your purpose. There's something about looking at something through your purpose that will change how you feel about the circumstance and the situation. When you understand that Yes, I didn't like this. Yes, this doesn't feel good. But the reality is I was sent here for a call. I was sent here on assignment. And if you can look at the agitation and the irritation through the lens of your assignment, oh, it will shift some things in your life. I want you to learn to look at your problems through the lens of your purpose. Look at the situation that is annoying you 
with the understanding that you have an assignment that is on your life. Nobody did this better than the Apostle Paul. Paul, Paul, the dude that wrote two-thirds of your New Testament, Paul did this the best. Paul had this uncanny ability to look at everything that he went through through the lens of his assignment, through the lens of his call. Who else but Paul, the dude who was whipped and beaten? No wonder my dad said the apostle Paul, the dude that was slapped, the dude that was forsaken, the dude that was stoned for this gospel, the dude that was shipwrecked and went through all kinds of pain and trials and tribulation and yet he counted all those joy because he understood the divine assignment that was on his life. See, I foresaw this moment. I I did not expect, I did not expect to get a whole lot of amens right here. I did not expect. I expected somebody to look at me like, okay, because, because the problem with many of us is that we think our comfort is a prerequisite for our call. No, no, we do, we do. We think our comfort and how good it feels is proof positive that we're supposed to step into something. Many of you right now, the reason you're gauging whether you should do something or not do something is, well, is it comfortable? What's the benefit package? Well, what's going to come with this? But the Apostle Paul was not concerned with his comfort. He was just concerned with answering the divine call and assignment and purpose that was on his life. Who else but Paul? You could not stop this dude. Wherever he went, he turned the city upside down because he was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that God had put him there on assignment. That's why they tried to stop Paul everywhere he went because they knew if he showed up in a town, stuff was going to change. Demons were going to flee. Lives were going to be transformed. They tried to do everything they could to stop Paul. They said, Paul, we're going to kill you. He said, that's cool. To die is gain. They said, okay, Paul, we're going to let you live. He said, that's cool, too, because to live is Christ. They said, okay, then, Paul, we're going to make you suffer. He said, that's cool, too, because I already know that the present sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared to the glory of God that's going to be revealed down on the inside of me. You cannot stop me with what I'm going through because there is a purpose that I'm looking at. Every problem in my life is viewed through the of the divine assignment. I need some people that know that there is a call on your life that is greater than any circumstance you're facing right now just to take 10 seconds and give God some praise. Like, you know, I got an assignment. Paul said, I can go through what I'm going through because I understand that I got a purpose that's bigger than my problem. Paul could teach a master's class on how to look at your trials and your sufferings through the lens of your divine purpose. And so in my text today, we're in Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, you have to understand that the Apostle Paul has already been converted and commissioned in Acts chapter 9. You know what happened in Acts chapter 9? He wasn't even trying to find God. Ooh, God found him. He was trying to go kill some Christians. He was on his high horse. How many know you can be on your high horse thinking this is what I'm going to do? I ain't thinking about God, but God will interrupt you. Some of you right now, that's why you came to Granada Theater. (laughs) You didn't even realize this. God is going to interrupt you. I love that about God. I love that sometimes you won't even have him on your radar, but he will have you on his radar. And when you're not even thinking about him, he will interrupt your schedule. Acts chapter 9, he gets knocked off his high horse and he is commissioned into his call. When we get to Acts chapter 13, he has already began his first missionary journey. And when he begins this missionary journey, the Holy Spirit separates Paul and Barnabas. The Holy Spirit divinely directs Paul's life. And on his first missionary journey, he's like, Paul, I don't want you out there in the streets by yourself. I want you to go with Barnabas. Can you see Paul and Barnabas together? Paul and Barney (laughs) headed out to preach the gospel. They got the assistant with them, with them. His name is John Mark. And they're headed out. And the Bible is actually teaching us a picture of your purpose and your calling that you cannot accomplish it by yourself. 
There are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. If your vision from God is only going to affect and change you, you do not have a vision from God. God will always give you a vision that is bigger than you. He will always give you a call that mandates that you need a collaboration with somebody else. Uh, there is no isolation in the kingdom of God. All of you that try to have a call and sing to Beyonce, me, myself, and I, that's all I got in the end. It does not work in the kingdom of God. You need somebody. Paul and Barnabas head out together. That's Acts chapter 13. They finish that first journey all the way to Acts chapter 15. And when that journey concludes, it was such a successful journey. They had such an effect in the kingdom. Paul looks at Barney and says, uh, we should do that again. We should do that again. We should go out and do a second round. And uh, Barney's like, that's cool. Let's do it. Uh, the problem is, um, Barney wants to take his cousin, John Mark. So Barney's like, yo, Paul, I'm going to call John Mark, and we're going to do it again because we all went together. And Paul goes, no, you're not. <laughs> and Barney's like, what you mean, no, I'm not? You are not bringing John Mark. Why can't John Mark go? Look, if we're going to go on this next trip, John Mark cannot go with us. It's going to be me and you, but it's not going to be John Mark. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that they get into this heated disagreement. They start going back and forth. Barney is like, let him come. And Paul's like, no, he can't come. And they keep going back and forth. They get into such a heated disagreement. Who? that they go their separate ways. These two mighty men of God, these two church planters, if you will, get into this massive argument. And ooh, I wish the Bible would have said what language that they used, but the Greek is clear. It was a heated disagreement, a heated argument because Paul did not want John Mark to go. And I'm be honest with you, I'm on Paul's side. You know why Paul didn't want John Mark to go? It's because John Mark deserted them halfway on the first journey. And I like Paul. Because Paul says, if you're going to ride with me, I don't need you flaking out when we halfway on the journey. Is there anybody in here that says, if you're going to roll with me, then roll with me. If you're going to be faithful, then be faithful. But don't be a type of person that got one foot in and one foot out. I'm with Paul. I like faithful people. I like people that when they tell you they're going to show up at Tuesday at 7 o'clock, they're going to be there at Tuesday at 635. I like people that their yes is their yes and their no is their no. This is even the season of life I'm in. If you don't like me, then look me in my face and tell me you don't like me. I can live with it. But disloyal? Throw in the towel? Quit people? I can't stand it. And so I'm with Paul, because Paul is an enforcer. The problem is, he was with Barnabas. And Barnabas, you know what his name means? Encourager. <laughs> you ever met them encouragers? Encouragers are different than enforcers. I'm like an enforcer. Pa Barnabas is an, I'm married to an encourager. <laughs> and I can hear old Barnabas, there's some Barnabas is in here, and they're like, he's like, come on, Paul. I mean, give him a chance. Didn't God give you another chance? <laughs> yeah, he walked away, but come on. He's a young kid. Give him one more chance. Don't you? Oh, y'all Barnabases. Y'all get on my nerves. We need both. We need both for the kingdom. We need encouragers and we need enforcers. But encouragers are just different than enforcers. Encouragers is like the parent in the stands watching their kid, and they're going to cheer no matter what, shooting the air ball. Yeah, you got close, baby. <laughs> encouragers. But not the Apostle Paul. He was an enforcer. He's like the referee. And it's interesting because they split ways. They had a disagreement and they split ways. They had a disagreement and all of a sudden Barnabas says, okay, I'm going to go my way with John Mark. And Paul says, cool, I'm going to find me a partner named Silas. And they split ways. Watch this. And the kingdom was still advanced. Can I tell you what I'm annoyed with? I'm annoyed with people that don't know how to have a disagreement <laughs> and agree to just disagree. Isn't it crazy how so many people have to demonize the other person 
that they disagree with in our culture today that just because you don't see it from my point of view then you a hater and you don't got a call on your life and they're demonic can I tell you just because somebody disagreed with you does not mean they're demonic just because they didn't see it from your viewpoint does not mean they're a hater disagreement is not always darkness and demons sometimes it's like you see it this way I see it this way it's cool God bless you on your journey and God bless me on my journey but the kingdom is big enough to have something where we can have a division but still have multiplication oh God says I can let y'all separate but the kingdom is still gonna be preached through Barnabas and John Mark and the kingdom is still gonna be preached through Paul and Silas and just cuz we disagree doesn't mean I have to demonize you and so they they go they separate and I know they're probably still salty about it the Bible didn't tell us but I bet they were they go their separate ways and all of a sudden here's Paul with Silas I can see Paul probably checking Silas here. Silas you sure you good to go on this next journey I don't need you leaving either you sure all right you faithful yeah I'm faithful are right, you ride or die yeah I'm ride or die all right if we're in a prison it's midnight can you sing yeah I can sing <laughs> sing something right now Right now, say something right now. I will bless the Lord, oh my soul. Okay, that's good. You're off key, but that's cool. Come on. He gets Paul and Silas, and all of a sudden, they start traveling. They start moving. They go to Figria. They go to Galatia. They get all the way to Acts chapter 16, verse 5. One of my favorite verses in the text, it says that the churches were strengthened in faith and increased in number daily. That means every single day, the faith of the believers was strengthened and the church started growing every single day as Paul and Silas are making their sojourn to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul, you know Paul, he said, this is working real good. He said, I think we need to go to Asia. It's modern day Turkey. And the Bible says something very intriguing. It says the Holy Spirit forbid them to go to Asia. Modern day Turkey. He said, all right, that didn't work. Go to Asia. Um, he said, let's go to Bithynia. He start heading to Bithynia. And it says again, the Holy Spirit restricted them and stopped them from going to Bithynia. I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed because the Bible does not say how the Holy Spirit restricted them. And I'm mad because this is Dr. Luke writing this right here. You know Luke wrote the book of Acts. And doctors are thorough. They give a lot of details. So Luke, it would help my walk with the Lord if you would have at least told us how did the Holy Spirit forbid them from going to Bithynia and forbid them from going to Asia? How did the Holy Spirit, was it like today? Like, mm, I don't have a piece about that. <laughs> Come on, you know how y'all do. <laughs> Church people always turn up their nose like they smell something. Mm, I don't have a piece. <laughs> Sometimes it's indigestion, but they still gonna say, ah, I don't have a, have a piece. But I wanna know how, 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 how were they forbid from going? Like, did they get ready to crank the boat? and the boat wouldn't start? Was there a hole in the boat? What, what, how did the Holy Spirit forbid them from going? The reason I'm asking is because is there anybody in here that has some things in your life that you need God to let you know? Am I supposed to go here? Am I supposed to go here? Should I apply for this job? Should I go to this college? Do I marry this person? How do you know? It would have helped me if Dr. Luke would have put in there this is how the Holy Spirit forbid them. But Dr. Luke does not give us those details. And because he didn't give us those details, I'm not going to bug Dr. Luke for those details. But I do want to stop here and thank God that although Luke didn't give us the details of how the Holy Spirit forbid them from going, at least he told us that the Holy Spirit did forbid them from going. And I want to pause right here and let somebody know that as a charismatic church that speaks in tongues more than all of you, I am thankful for the Holy Spirit that gives us empowerment. I am thankful for the Holy Spirit that lets me speak 
in a tongue that is unknown to man. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit that allow you to lay hands on somebody and they fall out in the power of God. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit that gives you empowerment. But even more than that, can I tell you, I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit that gives you discernment. The Holy Spirit is not just for your empowerment. The Holy Spirit is for your discernment. And I want to talk to somebody that's facing a big decision and you don't know what to do and you're about to step out in your own ingenuity and your own intellect and that ain't going to get it done. You need some discernment for the purpose that is on your life. You need some discernment for the call of God that is on your life and the Holy Spirit will give it to you. I wish somebody would take a praise break and thank God that he's given us the Holy Spirit to give me discernment. Tell me when I'm not supposed to go. Close every door that I'm not supposed to be in. If I ain't supposed to be at Gillies on a Sunday, then shut down Gillies. That's cool, because I found Granada on a Tuesday night, and I still give them the praise. But God, I thank you that you closed door. Y'all don't like that. Y'all don't like that, because you, you only want to shout when God gives you a yes. Oh, but can I tell you, maybe you're more spiritual than I am. I have shouted more, not because God gave me a yes. I have shouted more in my life because God has given me a no. Oh, I've been on some dates, and before we even ordered the appetizer, no. I've been in some churches, and before I I decided to come back, no. Have you ever had God give you a no? This gives us insight to how your God works. He's not always going to give you a yes. Sometimes the way he guides and directs your life is through a no. Oh, I need you to say that with your chest. Say no. Come on, say it with your chest. Say no. Ooh, have you ever had God just give you a no. Oh, that is a beautiful thing to get a no. That's what they got. Lord, should we go to Asia? No. All right. <laughs> should we go to Bithynia? No. And some of y'all, oh, this is going to mess you up. Some of you want the, no. some of you want the, yes. <laughs> I was looking for a no. Um, stay with me. Some of you want the, yes. before you go. Or the yes, before you go. But hear me. Oh, sometimes you don't even get it until you go. Some, sometimes it's not until you actually put your hand on the door and try to. I, I wish it was different, but the reality is sometimes it's not until you take the step and try to go that you get the no. I want to pause and thank God for his no's. I want to thank God, watch this, that yes, he orders my steps, but if he orders my steps, he's also got to order my stops. He's also got to divinely orchestrate places, situations, people, jobs, opportunities, where he will say, and that's generally how he does it. Generally, and my, this is just me. Generally, I'll get a, no! Like, okay. And then my, the yes will be like, yes. I'll be like, say it again, yes. So, say it, yes. <laughs> you ever had a guy hit you? Yes. <laughs> like, let me fast for like five days, because I didn't, I didn't hear that. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to tell you how to get direction for your life, see. Some of you have sensory overload, and no wonder God can't give you clear direction, because every time he would give you direction, you scrolling on the gram, you on Netflix, you watching TV, you with your friends, but God will call you sometimes to shut some things down so you can hear that quiet yes in your spirit. Said, uh, said we tried to go there, didn't work. Try to go to Bithynia, didn't work. And what do you do? What do you do when you try to open the door and it didn't work? You pause and you wait till you hear. Paul, Paul.
pauses. And when he does, thank God that he speaks. The Bible says he gets a vision. Who? He gets a vision. And he sees a man in Macedonia. And the man says, come here. <laughs> That's probably what it sounded like, too. <laughs> I'm imagining if you get a vision. Oh! Paul! The artist formerly known as Saul! <laughs> come! <laughs> to Macedonia! <laughs> I don't care what it sounds like, as long as you give me clarity. He gets a vision to go to Macedonia. So we set sail from Troas. And he's got Paul and Silas, Dr. Luke. And they start heading out to Macedonia, to that metropolis of Philippi. Now I want you to hear me. I'm almost done. Are you bored? No. The vision, watch this, the vision was of a man in Macedonia saying, come help us. Vision was clear. A dude, we don't know what he looked like, but he's in Macedonia. He says, come help us. He knew where to set sail. Clear vision of a man in Macedonia. They start sailing towards Macedonia, pull up on the shore, and find a women's Bible study. <laughs> he gets a vision of a man. Saying, oh, <laughs> come <laughs> to Macedonia. And he gets to Macedonia and pulls up by the riverside to a women's Bible study. <laughs> that was the place of prayer. Pastor Manny knows this, that you could not have a Jewish synagogue unless you had 10 men in the city. So the fact that he's pulling up to the riverside is proof positive. They didn't even have two, 10 dudes in the city. And so he pulls up to a women's Bible study by the riverside when he got a vision of a man saying, come. What do you do when you got a clear vision and you set out on the vision that you saw? But when you get to the place, the place looks contradictory to the vision. Am I the only one that's ever got a clear word? Some of you, ooh, some of you came to Dallas on that. It's like you knew you were in a tropical environment, super nice weather. And God said, Dallas, you never even been except for the airport. <laughs> And you step out like, yeah, and that heat hits you. You're like, this does not look like <laughs> my vision. What do you do when the vision seems contradictory to what you saw? You stick to the mission. Paul was mandated by a mission to declare the gospel. And though he pulls up and there is no synagogue for him to preach to, he said, I may as well interrupt this women's Bible study. And he starts getting on mission. I don't know who this is for, but maybe you got a vision and you got clarity and you showed up and it doesn't look like it, but God says, stick to your mission. Stick to the mission. Sometimes the vision looks different, but stick to the mission and the mandate that is on your life. Can I tell you? God has given me a mission to have a microphone and preach the gospel, but I give him permission to change what that looks like. When it was the pandemic, I was doing it in an empty room in front of a camera. If we can't meet again, I'll do it there. Whatever I have to do, sometimes it'll change and shift, but I stick to my mission, even when it looks contradictory. I was on the road. I would travel, preach messages at churches, and then peace out. And God said, oh, guess what? You're going to pastor. I said, me? <laughs> and he changed. But you stick to the mission. Paul preaches to a successful businesswoman named Lydia. Gets saved. Her whole family gets saved. Transformed. Why? Because Paul 
stuck to the mission. Her whole family gets transformed. This was a wealthy business woman. She sold purple cloth at Zara. It's in the text, read it when you get home. Transforms Lydia's household. Lydia says, would you come stay at my house? Oh, you know, Lydia had a bad to the bone house. She was wealthy. So Paul stays at Lydia's house. Their whole household gets saved. He spends the night there at her dope crib. And I'm sure he's thinking, Lord, this is nice. Thank you for the clarity to come to Macedonia. <laughs> oh, come on, can we talk about that? Have you ever stepped out and obeyed God and then you saw what he did? And you're like, Lord, for real? I didn't know it was going to be like this. I'm telling you, I, I speak for myself. I'm telling you, when I first started preaching, you should see some of the places that I stayed, some of the youth groups, and then God started blessing. I'm like, Lord, I didn't know it was going to be like this. <laughs> blessing of the Lord. But sometimes God wants to know, are you doing it for the blessing? Or are you called to the mission? Because the same Paul, the same Paul that's excited about staying in the beautiful house of Lydia, gets up the next day and goes to the place of prayer and starts preaching again. Got good night's sleep. You know, she had a beautiful bed, down feather. Starts preaching. All of a sudden, in the middle of the sermon, had to be behind him. You know people are crazy. Sometimes they just shout things out. He hears a voice. He said, these men are servants of the Most High God. In the middle of his sermon, day one. That's weird. Keith's preaching. Day two, middle of the message. These men are servants of the Most High God. It's like, who is this? Amen. <laughs> Let me preach. Day three, starts preaching. These men are servants of the Most High God. All right. We think they know now. Starts preaching. Day four. These men are servants of the Most High God. Silas, if you don't take her out. <laughs> Day five, preacher. These men are servants of the Most High God. <laughs> Day six. Day seven. Day eight. Day 23, preacher. These men are servants of the Most High God. Oh. <sighs> are you annoyed yet? <laughs> See, I don't know how long she did it. I know it went on a while. Put Acts 16, verse 18. The Bible says that she, uh, she did this for many days. <laughs> many days. I don't know how long many is. All I know is every pop-up service. These men are servants of the most high God. And here's what blows my mind. She was right. She was right, but the Bible lets us know that she was possessed by a spirit of divination. A demonic spirit, hear me, that gave her the ability to tell people's futures. In other words, a spirit that had the ability to prophesy and tell you, that, to tell you, the, but it was not a spirit from God. Be very careful. what you expose yourself to. Be very careful what atmospheres you walk in. Just because somebody's able to precisely tell you something does not mean it came from the Spirit of God. Just because they throw a scripture on it does not mean it came from the Spirit of God. Just because they change their voice and say, th th thus saith the Lord, does not mean it came from God. Satan himself used scripture on Jesus. Stop being moved just because somebody quoted the scripture or told you something. Because a fortune teller can do that. Somebody playing with cards can do that. This was a demonic spirit saying the right thing. Ooh, this, this, this is confusing. Because I'm thinking if it's a demonic spirit, it should say, these men are trash. They terrible. Don't listen to nothing they got to say. Is that what she said? She said they are servants of the Most High God. 
And no wonder if you studied the Greek, it says she had a spirit of divination, was actually the spirit of the python, because that's what the enemy will do. He tries to deceive you, and the way he deceives you is he will wrap a lie in truth. He will coil a lie in truth so that it will deceive you. She was saying the right thing, and it was from an evil spirit. Finally, Paul got annoyed. I don't know on what day, but I know on a certain day. He said, enough is enough. And the Bible says he turned around and he said, watch this, not to the girl. Because how many of you know, if you truly want to deliver people, deliverance must come from a heart of compassion. You can't be angry at somebody and want to get them delivered. You get angry at the spirit that is possessing that person. You get angry at the spirit that's keeping that person down. You get angry at the spirit. This is actually what the enemy wants to do. This young girl, this young girl who was being pimped out, this young girl who was being human trafficked, if you will, because she had owners that were making her use that gift, that perverted gift for their own personal gain. But thank God for the Apostle Paul that had not just the Spirit's empowerment, but the Spirit's discernment to know you saying the right thing, but it's coming from an evil spirit and enough is enough. Today is your day of deliverance. Today is your day of freedom. So he turned around and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and immediately that spirit came out and she was set free and delivered. I want every devil in hell to know that God still has delivering power. I want every witch, I want every soothsayer to know that God still has delivering power. We speak to the spirit that tries to keep you oppressed and and depressed and say come out in the name of Jesus oh I need somebody to open up your mouth and give God some praise like you know he's got power to set you free he's got power to deliver say come out in the name of Jesus spirit came out this girl was set free. Hear me. Some of you in here, you've got an incredible call. You've got an incredible gift on your life. But the enemy, just like this girl's masters, he wants to pervert the gift that is in you and on you for his kingdom, for his profit. And I'm declaring to you today, let the scales come off of your eyes so you can see Jesus for who he is and be set free. I'm praying right now that every deceptive thing that is blocking you from seeing the truth will dissipate tonight on the power of the Holy Spirit. This girl is set free. It was good for her, but it turned the city upside down. Her owners realized that they weren't gonna make profit anymore because that was at the root of it. They were using her for money. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil didn't say money was evil. It says the love of it is the root of all evil. All kinds of evil that is pervasive in our culture and our society today. If you get down to the root, it's the love of money. And here's Paul and Silas shaking a city upside down. The magistrates bring them in. They strip their clothes. They start beating them and whipping them, kicking them, 
flesh lacerated. The mob jumped in and started shouting and beating and kicking. They get thrown into the inner prison. Understand there's a difference between just being thrown in prison and being thrown in the inner prison. It had three sections. If you were on the outside, you could move around. If you were on the inside, you could move around a little bit. But if you were in the inner prison, it was a dungeon. You did not even have mobility of your arms or your legs. They fastened their feet. Their entire body was held down to the structure of the prison. It was a dungeon. It was the darkest place of the prison. There was no light. Their bleeding wounds are going everywhere in the space as they're in the inner place in the dark. And here's what messed me up. They're there because they obeyed God. The bruises on their body, the lacerations in their back, the prison that they're in was not from disobedience. It was from obedience. Some of us can't even handle when our disobedience has gotten us in painful circumstances. Some of us in here tonight, it is your disobedience that's got you in a place of desperation and now you're crying out to God because you got a bad doctor's report or because you're reaping something you did. Most of us cry out when we get in disobedience and we reap it, but what do you do when the pain that you're in when the darkness that you're in is because you obeyed? Wait a minute. This is different than Lydia's house. This. Silas, we're, our obedience got us here. If you're honest, and you were in a dark place and it was the obedience of God. The last thing on most of our minds would have been to praise. The last thing on most of our minds would have been to worship. Most of us would have turned our back on God because they're trying to figure out how did my obedience get me in a dark place. But I love that this is in the text today because it gives hope to somebody who understands that maybe your obedience has gotten you in a place where it looks dark. Maybe your obedience has gotten you in the place where you're feeling pain. But how many of you know just because you're in a dark place does not mean that you disobey because God does his greatest miracles sometimes in the dark. God will do some things developmentally in the dark. There are some things that happen in a dark place. You you can't see it but God is doing something you can't feel it all you feel is pain but God is doing something and I'm telling you even when you're in a dark place don't you lose your worship don't you lose your praise because God can still do things in a dark place God can still do things in a place that looks contradictory to what you said yes to They're in a dark place. They're bleeding. They're bruised. It's dark because we obeyed. And you know the story, but spoiler alert, at midnight. <laughs> at midnight, they start singing hymns and praying to God. And every preacher that's worth his weight starts preaching about midnight. Midnight. That, that place where it's dark, but it's still a new day. That place where something new has happened, but nothing has changed. 
that place where yesterday's darkness has bleeded over into a new day and nothing externally looks like anything has changed. That place where you lifted up your hands but your bank account was still the same. That place where you were worshiping God but you were still lonely. That place where you were crying out to God but you still had the bankruptcy. I'm talking about midnight. Don't you give up at midnight. Just because it's dark don't mean it ain't a new day. God still has made it a new day, even though it's gone. They praise God, and an earthquake shook the foundation of the prison. Now, wait a minute. This blew my mind. I never saw this there. They're in the inner part of the prison. It's already dark in there. How many know when you're already in a dark place, you don't know if it's midnight or if it's day when you're already in a dark place? This is Luke writing about the time. They didn't know it was midnight. They were not looking at their watch saying, oh, you know what? At midnight, God, no. They didn't know what time it was. Furthermore, they didn't praise God expecting the earthquake to come. Come on, y'all. Keep it 100. Anybody ever been to prison? Ever been to prison? Don't, don't answer that. It's cool. It's cool. I'm not saying you got a testimony, but, you know, church folks judge you sometimes. Yeah. Nobody's ever gone to prison and said, man, I wish God would send an earthquake to get me out of here. That was not on their radar. They were not praising God in the expectation that he would send an earthquake to get them out. They were just doing what they had already done. They, had, they were doing what they had always done, which was to give devotion to God. Some of you are annoyed because you are in a dark place. But God says, even when you can't see it, can you still give me your devotion? See, devotion doesn't count when everything's going good. Devotion counts when you're in a situation that God got you in, but yet you're still giving God the praise. God got them in the situation, but they were still talking to God anyway. That's when God shows up. When God got you in the situation, but you say, God, even though you got me here, I'm not going to stop talking to you. That's where your power is. Isn't that what Jesus did on the cross? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God got him in the situation, but he still was talking to God. Don't stop talking, even if he got you. And they started praising God. Yes, God. When they praised, not only their shackles were loose, the whole prison's shackles got loose. Come on, this next praise right here. Some of y'all sitting down. I don't know why. You don't understand that your praise has the power to affect somebody that's not even at this pop-up service. You don't even know that your hallelujah has the power to reach somebody that's not even here. I want this next shout of praise to come from somebody who said, I don't just want to get out. I want my family out. I want my cousin out. I want my mama out. I want my daddy out. I got enough praise on the inside of me to lose my whole generation. should have put a muzzle on their mouth. This is why I love God. Because God will put you in a place where the enemy doesn't even know what to do with you. It was their mouth that got them in the prison in the first place. It was their mouth that was declaring the goodness of God. It was their mouth that was declaring the gospel. It was their mouth that was preaching the good news. It was their mouth that said, come out in the name of... It was their mouth that got them in trouble. They shackled the wrong thing. They shouldn't have shackled their legs. They shouldn't have shackled their hands. They should have put a muzzle on their mouth. Because whenever you open up your mouth, God has to step in the 
situation. I wish somebody in here would open up your mouth and give God praise. Come on, like you know that there's something powerful about your worship. Come on. God who they obeyed and got them in the situation they were in. The Bible says that all the prisoners chains were loosed. There was a guard who had the responsibility of making sure that none of those prisoners escaped. If they escaped, he would be killed. The prison doors are shaken. There's a rubble everywhere. They're free. If it was me, I would have taken off running. My chains are gone. God, you did it. I'm out. Paul and Silas don't do that. They stay there. They stay there long enough to see this prison keeper, this Roman guard, if you will, pull his sword, getting ready to commit suicide because he'd rather kill himself than to be killed. encounter with this Roman guard is that according to the text this is the first man he's encountered remember when he got the vision he saw a man in Macedonia saying come help us but when he got to the shore, all he saw was the women. When he was preaching the gospel, he called the demonic spirit out of a woman. But all of a sudden, in a dark place, in a place that didn't make sense, in a place where he had the right to be annoyed because he obeyed God and his obedience got him beat. His obedience got him whipped. His obedience got him in a dark place. But because he could still cry out to a God who got him in the place he was in, I wonder if the reason he couldn't leave that prison is because that guard looked a little bit like the man that was in the vision. And he said, wait a minute, how can I be annoyed? came here for such a time as this. I came here for you. I don't know. I don't know who the man was. I don't know. I don't know the vision he saw. But I do know that he stayed long enough to stop him from killing himself. And that man looked at him and said, perhaps the most powerful words ever written in your Bible. He says, sir, will you please show us how I can be saved? Show me how I can be saved. And I think in that moment, when not only he got saved, but his whole household got saved. Oh, Paul understood. I might be annoyed. Can I give you the rest of my title? I'm annoyed, but I'm assigned. I'm annoyed, but I'm a sad. I might be annoyed, but God wanted me to be here. God sent me here.
dismissing the pain. I'm not dismissing the dark. I'm just letting you know you're assigned. You're assigned to that family, to that job, to that friend. Don't you dare kill yourself. If that guard would have killed himself, his whole family would not have been saved. If that guard committed suicide, his whole household would have never experienced the power of salvation. That's why you can't give up. That's why you can't throw in the towel. I just wonder if Paul didn't run from the prison because that man looked familiar. A church will later be established there in Macedonia because the city was Philippi. This is where the gospel broke forth in Europe. If Paul wouldn't have gone there, there would be no Philippians. There would be no Corinthians. And all the heartache, the blocked doors, the closed doors, the looking at a vision that looks contradictory, the annoyances don't seem like annoyances when you understand you're a sign yeah. you know why I didn't rush to plant a church until I heard from God you know why we met here in 2019 and we said this ain't a church it's a social night I was pausing to make sure I got a word from God to plant this church because I know the hell you face to be in leadership I spent my life on the road talking to pastors I know the attack on your family when you really start transforming and changing a city I know the battles the struggles. We're a year in and I've had some moments having some now where I've been annoyed. The thing that keeps me getting up and grabbing a microphone is that I know I've been assigned. I've been assigned. And the assignment Simon gives perspective to the annoyances. I want to pray for some people tonight. The enemy has made the annoyance seem louder than the assignment. Somebody that's about to walk away from something that God called you to. You were so happy setting out for Macedonia. <laughs> you saw a vision. And now you're in prison and you're bleeding. You're annoyed. You've lost your praise. You've lost your worship. Paul and Silas were doing what they had always done. They worshiped. If that's you tonight, without anybody telling you to bow your head or close your eyes, I want you to come to the front. Come to the front. The annoyance has gotten louder than your assignment. And God said he wants to refill you tonight with his presence and with his power. He wants to refresh you tonight. You're going to go back to that assignment. Hear me full of the Holy Spirit with a fresh commitment. Come on, come on. If you know this is for you, come, 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 come. Come on. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I want you to come. I want you to come. Get as close to this altar as you can. Get as close as you can. Get as close as you can. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Father, I thank you that your healing balm is going through tonight. 
Oh God, in the same way that that jailer began to heal the wounds and begin to clean up the wounds of Paul and Silas, Lord, today would you begin to clean and heal the wounds, God? The hurt, the pain, the betrayal, God. Oh God, would you remind and reaffirm the assignment and the call, God, we've, we've been through so much and the enemy's trying to get us to walk away and make us think that we, ha we didn't have an assignment, but God, tonight, Holy Spirit, breathe a fresh wind, a fresh touch, God, called for such a time as this. Come on, don't you give up on your assignment just because you're annoyed.